I think I may have uh, uh, referred to the uh, fishermen as Simon and Peter, and I actually meant to say Simon and Andrew. It was Simon, Peter, and Andrew. So Gary was right. I was right. <laughs> Please pray with me. May these words that I speak be grounded in my soul, encouraged by the God presence in me. And may these words that you hear be captured by your soul, enlivened by the God presence in you. Amen. The story says, Jesus said to them, follow me. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. This story has often been seen as some kind of blind devotion which caused anyone who encountered Jesus to drop everything and tag along. But if we look at the whole gospel story from Mark, we know that many were encountered. Many, many were encountered and only a few would become followers. I see this story as a move to act once one sees that action is necessary, an action to bring about some kind of change. Jesus was a disciple of John, the baptizer, who called people to metanoia, a word I've used, a Greek word I've used over and over. Metanoia, which means to change your mind and your heart and to see the Spirit of God in new ways. It is clear from Mark's Gospel that Jesus continued his relationship with John after he was baptized. And then, when John is arrested as the leader of this gaggle of anti-empire peasants, Jesus begins his own mission to bring change in his way. His dream his grand dream is a new, is a creation of the kingdom of God in his time and place. A new way of living in the spirit of God and a new way of being peace and being justice in the world. And so he leaves the desert and instead of going home to Nazareth, he goes to the port city of Capernaum with a plan to meet like-minded men and women. And yes, there were women, they just didn't get named. Like-minded men and women that would do this work with him, that would, that would begin this mission. John Pilch, in the book The Cultural World of Jesus, says, gathering a, f a following, a coalition, was a common occurrence in the Mediterranean world. <coughs> a group that gathers for a specific purpose for a limited time. The aspirations, the grievances, the objectives, and the hopes of the fishermen in this story are not spelled out, but it is probable that they found common cause in the oppressive difficulties of their daily lives. Such experiences would be the underpinning for Jesus' broader project of proclaiming the reign of God rather than the reign of God. Of Caesar. And Pilch goes on to say, Western believers like to romanticize Jesus' call of the first followers. But cultural insights demonstrate that issues of well-being and livelihood were at stake. This is the stuff that is at the heart of necessary change, and it is the catalyst for change in every age, including our own. In an evolutionary world, and that's what we are a part of, change is the norm, whether we like it or not. Change is the norm. And change that works for the betterment of our lives, our societies, and our world is essential. Martin Luther King Jr. said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. And so we must straighten our backs and work for freedom. Another person cannot ride you unless your back is bent. 
This is the kind of change, the same kind that Jesus straightened his back for in his time, that brings light into our lives and into our world. So what is the change we are called to today? What cause would cause us to drop our nets, metaphorically speaking, and follow? And specifically, what are we as a community of faith, a gathering of would-be followers of Jesus, called to change? I find it somewhat ironic that the Christian church has always been and continues to be so resistant to change, considering that is how Jesus began a dream that is yet to be fulfilled. We are so resistant to change, in fact, that there are endless jokes about our solid resistance. For instance, do you know how many church members it takes to change a light bulb? The answer? Change? Change? My grandmother bought that light bulb. Or, then there's the story of the minister who was being interviewed by a search committee of his congregation. As the interview was drawing to a close, the chairperson asked if he had any final words. To which he replied, If I am called as minister to this congregation, I will work tirelessly, tirelessly, to bring us into the 20th century. The chairperson responded, don't you mean the 21st century? The minister paused and then said, let's take it one century at a time. <laughs> the reality, I believe, is that our resistance to change, our mantra of, we've always done it that way, is bringing about our very demise. <clears throat> Evolution is the way of the universe. The human species is not separate from evolution, but rather is an integral part of it. We continue to evolve. We continue to change. And it is part of a continuous change that drives everything that is. I also believe that it's the very Spirit of God, the great mystery that is at the very heart of the whole evolutionary process. It is the God presence in all of creation, including us, that pushes us and prods us to be always open, open to change our minds and our hearts with our evolving knowledge. Our faith, and certainly not our church, were ever intended to be static, unmoving, unchanging, holding tightly to one or many absolute truths. Rather, our faith, like our lives and our world, need to be fluid, with a willingness to change our hearts and our minds with each new insight, just as the author of Proverbs writes, over a thousand years ago, he already had this. You need to pay attention to the insights. For too long, the church has discouraged people from thinking, from questioning, in order to maintain control. And most people through the centuries bought into that because human beings want certainty. We want certainty. We don't want uncertainty or ambiguity, because that makes us anxious. But frankly, my sense is that definitive answers and absolute truths seem only to make us more anxious, because we are afraid that someone will challenge what we know to be right, or worse, what happens if it turns out we're wrong? Wisdom. The wisdom that is at the heart of God is not calling us to believe a certain dogma or to worship in a certain way. Wisdom is calling us instead to open our hearts and our minds to ask the questions. 
why and how and what's next and where are we going Jesus as wisdom incarnate is calling us to live into the fullness of our lives Jesus Simon Andrew James John and many many more throughout our time all began the journey to really live their lives the moment they asked, Why is my life the way it is? Why is there so much injustice? And why have I settled for the status quo? It was in the questioning that they began to see the Spirit and the wisdom of God at work, pushing them and prodding them to change their lives, and in changing their lives, they were doing their part to change the world. And it is in the act of leaving or dropping their nets, of refusing to accept what is, that change begins, and each of them become light in the world, the light of change. I wonder what nets we are being called to leave behind. As a faith community, what is the change we are being called to embrace? Are we prepared to let go of beliefs that no longer make sense with our new understanding of God? Are we willing to let go of rituals that no longer resonate with generations we long to see as part of our community? Are we prepared to let go of the notion that we need to support the political and economic norm called consumerism? Are we prepared to let go of our fear of what is not yet known and embrace the God Spirit that is at work in our lives and, yes, in our world to bring change? <coughs> C.S. Lewis has a powerful little story which speaks to me about the necessity of change. He says, It may be hard for an egg to turn into a bird. We, uh, sorry, it would be a jolly sight harder for it to learn to fly while remaining in the egg. <laughs> we are like eggs at present, he says. And you cannot go on indefinitely just being a decent, ordinary egg. We must be hatched and learn to fly or go bad. Jesus is calling us to leave our nets, to leave our shells, and live in the change that we want to see. Just as he did in his short time in this wondrous world. May we seek the wisdom and find the courage to fly, to bring the light of change to our lives, to our church, and to our world.